Ashton. Um, this is my first time to Polish Fest, although I've been trying for years to get here. Um, circumstances would uh, you know, preclude me from coming, and so I'm very excited to be here this year. I've been in the area over in St. Paul a few times to talk about genealogy. There is a small group of people in the area spread from Loop City to, to St. Paul who are interested in trying to start a genealogy club or society in the area. And so if you're interested in that, please let me know afterward and I'll give you one or two names to get in touch uh, with about that. But um, if you're just getting started right now, I want you to have all the support you can get so that you don't get too frustrated and just, you know, end up dropping it. Um, my name is Laura Anderson. Uh, my grandfather was named Ed Kalkuski and he was born right here in Ashton. Um, he lived here until about the 1920s when uh, I was mentioning earlier Frank Taylor over in, I think, it, I forget, Loop City or St. Paul, St. Paul. Uh, he had a, an awful lot of farmland in the state, all over the place. And in the 1920s, several Polish families, from Howard County especially, and a few from Sherman, went to Keith County to farm Frank Taylor's land for him. And so that's where you'll find Krajewski's Jars Jehoric, um, Kosmiski. Uh, there's several that are over there in the western part of the state, and that's you know a little bit of the story about how they they got there. They started out here in in the the major Polish settlements. Um, some of you may know more about the history of the Polish settlers in here than I do. What I learned is from books and magazines and things like that. Um, what you have heard is probably more oral tradition and your grandparents told your parents who told you. Um, so if you have anything to add to what, what I might tell about a little bit of the Polish history here, please feel free to do so. The original Polish colonies that were settled right along the Howard Sherman border, more or less. Um, it began because of a man named Jan Barzinski. Some of you might recognize his name as John Barzinski, who was in St. Paul for some time. Uh, he negotiated with the railroad to be a land agent for them. And the reason he negotiated to be a land agent was because he had this idea already formed and in place to settle Polish colonies here. His brother was Vincent Barzynski. They were a very educated family in Poland. Uh, Vincent was the, the main father at St. Stanislaus Koska Church in Chicago. And you all know that in the late 1860s and 1870s, Chicago was beginning to get a large Polish population. Um, there was a little bit of strife and dissent from St. Stanislaus broke off another part that became the Trinity Church in Chicago. Um, but as far as we're concerned, if you were to look for any of your ancestors who may have been in Illinois before they came here, try St. Stanislaus in Chicago. Okay. Um, Jan Barzynski was first a uh, publisher. He started in Missouri with a Polish newspaper that I can't pronounce because my grandmother wouldn't teach my dad's family how to speak Polish. Um, but he started in Missouri with a Polish newspaper. He wasn't really in the right geographic location for that and he ended up by the early, by 1870 I want to say, 71, he was in Chicago and he ran the largest Polish publication in Chicago. His brother was the, the father at the Polish Catholic Church in Chicago, so you know they had a lot of good interest for the Poles in mind. They were very powerful and they had connections to help. John Barzynski also formed the Polish Roman Catholic Union of America. Now this formed about 1873. They have a, a really nice museum 
and archives of their own in Chicago too. But because John Barzinski felt the polls in the large cities, and the cities we're going to be most concerned with are Chicago and Pittsburgh, they were getting lost. They were farmers who came to work in the cities. They may have worked in mines. They were floundering, and, and they weren't necessarily keeping all their culture and tradition. And because it was very high on Jan Barzinski's priority list to keep the Polish traditions and cultures alive, he wanted to take families out of the cities and give them their own colony. About 1875, he and another man who were, was with this uh, Polish Roman Catholic Union of America and Father Anthony Claviter. Um, he was the, uh, a priest at uh, the Polish Catholic Church in Pittsburgh. The three men set out on a trek across the midsection of the country to find a place for these Polish settlements to, to start building. And it turned out it was right here. They had a lot of support from the uh, Archdiocese in Chicago. There's a book right here I got. This is the History of the Catholic Church in Nebraska by Henry Casper. There are three volumes to this. This deals specifically with the immigrants, the Irish, Bohemians, and Polish settlements in Nebraska. I got this on uh, the web. I just did a search for it at Amazon or Barnes & Noble, something like that. And it wasn't terribly expensive. I think it might have been 12 or $14. But there's not a whole lot of these out there. If you see one and you're interested in any kind of the history of the settlement here in, in Nebraska, I would highly recommend it. I don't know if the, if the uh, libraries around here have a copy, but if they do, check it out. This is volume three, I think. Yes, it's volume three. So the first two volumes have a lot more information in it about the Catholic Church in general, but this is specifically about the Poles, the Czechs, and some Irish, which <laughs> I don't think any of us have Irish blood. <laughs> we might. It's Henry W. Casper, C-A-S-P-E-R. And he was with the church, but I, I don't remember what his uh, title was. Um, but he quotes in here many letters written from Anthony Claviter to the, uh, I think it's Bishop O'Connor at the time in, in Omaha. So if you're really interested in that, you can also go to the ar archives of the Archdiocese in Omaha and they can kind of point you in the right direction to find out some Catholic history. Um, so, Anthony Claviter and Jan Barzinski are traveling through the Midwest. They find this beautiful spot right here. They say, okay, they go back to Chicago the next year when the Polish Roman Catholic Union of America convenes. They say, this is where we're going to go. Uh, we're going to start our colonies here. So, again, John became the land agent for the railroad. He sold, he recruited through his newspaper. He sold the land two of the, the first families who were coming here and that he did help them somewhat um, establish themselves here. Anthony Claviter became the first father or priest at St. Anthony's Church in Farwell and that was the first Polish Catholic Church west of the Mississippi. I'm sure you all know this. Um, there is a microfilm of the baptisms and marriages from 1877 through 1905. And that microfilm is available through the Nebraska State Historical Society. And in the early 1890s, <laughs> bless his heart, the father there wrote the towns in Poland where every family was from. So if there was a baptism or a marriage during that time frame, which pretty much covers almost everyone, this, the odds are that you'll get a clue as to where in Poland your family was from. That to me has been the most helpful resource that I've found in, in eight years.
of, of trying to find the towns in Poland. Once I found my family in those baptisms with the, the town name in Poland, then I'm able to go to other libraries and other sources, find that town, look at it on a map, get the church records, and I found all the births and the marriages of my family just before they came to America. And so I'll get into that a little bit in the whole genealogy thing. But for now, just to know that there is some history recorded around here, the biggest part for you as a beginner is to find out where those resources are. Um, and then to just get out there and, and go from place to place. Go to Lincoln if you can, to the Historical Society. Go to the county seats in the county here uh, in Howard County, in Platt County, sometimes Polk County might have something. Um, but your early land deeds, some are filed in Grand Island and some are here in your local county. Um, it, it's, just, it's just all going to fall together once you start following a little paper trail. And, and I know sometimes it's extremely frustrating at first. But when you, when you realize that a lot of the families, not all, came from Chicago and Pittsburgh because of those two connections between Father Klaviter and Jan Barzinski, they heavily recruited those two churches, and they're both named St. Stanislaus Koska, one in Chicago, one in Pittsburgh. And when you realize that, you can go straight there and ask at the archives um, please find this in this family about this year. They'll do that and they'll send it to you and that'll give you your next clue to, to go on. Um, so many of our Polish families from the homeland went to Pittsburgh. Those names include, just off the top of my head, the Kalkuskis, the Majewskis, Stoby, Mashka, uh, I think Jankowski, and I'm sorry if I say these wrong, um, and, and, and several more were all from one small area south of Gdansk, and they went to Pittsburgh. Uh, I think there were Kaminskis there too, and then, and I'm speaking in terms of my own family, that's my grandfather's family went there. My grandmother's family went to the Chicago area. They were from a, an area in western Poland, near the German border, um, and those names were Jarosz, and Jehoric, and Dimic, and Smidra, um, Pahoda was there too. It's funny, once you find your family, you're going to find five or six or seven or eight more families who settled this area who are from the same area in Poland where your family came from. Uh, Badura. I've just found some in Chicago. Yeah, that's where my great came yes, and in fact, I've, I might have even brought some copies with me um, from that St. Stanislaus Koska in Chicago. The Baduras are, are there early on. Um, Mudluf, Mendic, or Mendic. Uh, I didn't see those there, but it, as I'm going through this reel of, of the old baptisms, I'll look through it once and I'll find all the names I recognize, and I'll go back and look through it again, <coughs> and I'll still see a couple more. So I, I'm in the midst of just going through that whole Chicago thing right now, and it's really exciting to well, see I'm those. Here, I, to I just, yes, I have to talk to you. Yes. <laughs> um, so that's kind of how the Poles came to settle right here. So how did they get these states? Like, what, you know, to the states? Or to right here. Most of them came on ships. They did come on ships. Yes. There is a really wonderful resource called the Germans to America series. It's a, I think, 62 or 63 volume set. And as the question is, how did they come to America? If you have any idea of the years, these books are wonderful. They're indexed. Every name is not spelled right. So you might have to try two or ten different spellings of your last name if it's particularly tricky. 
but this germans to america is a really good resource for that the bad or as are are online there there is their ships passenger list is online so i can tell you how to find the bad or that one is there and it's um which who married eleanor ogoric no johanna ogoric that was like the the first bad or was there their immigration ships record is online there there are a lot of volunteers who who put uh, all things genealogy online but it takes a long time this was at a place called the immigrant immigrant ships transcribers guild and it's i s t g i think it used to be dot org um, but if you were to do a Google search or something on the internet for Immigrant Ships Transcribers Guild, you'll come to their website. And it's not complete by any means, but if you are so <laughs> lucky enough as to be, you know, looking for a ship that they already have transcribed, it's wonderful. Um, so there's that. Is there any question about how the polls came to this area and why they came right here? Does anybody have any information other than what I mentioned that's interesting that your family has passed on to you about coming here? My great grandfather came from Chicago. Settled, settled in the Catholic area. It was a place called Shunite or something like that. Oh, Shunite. Okay. And he built a, a grocery store. And, and this is Stanley Bedora. Stanislaus. Stanislaus Bedora came from Chicago. Do you have any idea how they came? Did they travel by train? You know, I don't know that. Yeah. And uh, then the railroad did not come through the Shoney area. Mm -hmm. So he came into Ashton and built the store in Ashton. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good point. Um, the Paplin area, north, am I pointing the right? I shouldn't point. <laughs> There's no mountains here like Colorado. The mountains are west. Um, that Paplin area was settled first. The, the train did not go through there like they had anticipated. And so several of them moved down to the Ashton area. Um, so the, the railroads were just a huge impetus to bring people here. If the railroad didn't go by your town, your town probably didn't survive or it moved. Um, Yes, the, the Baduras um, donated land up near Paplin for the Paplin Church and the cemetery, which if you haven't been up there is just beautiful. Um, if you have any Polish, you know, history at all, I'm different than a lot of people, but I enjoy going to these cemeteries, looking at the names, looking at the stones. It's history, and it's our history, even if I don't know every name there, it's still, it's still the history of this area, which I find fascinating. Um, okay, that's, go ahead. Um, I'm a Krajewski or Krajewski. Uh-huh. It's a familiar name to me, too. I, in fact, they were one of the families that went to the Keith County area, too. Yeah, but not all of them. My family dropped the W. Everybody, all, all these Polish families have changed their spellings. Yeah. Um, you're right. There are, I don't mean to exclude, there are families. Macheskis were from uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. At, at one point, I hear, I, I try to verify it, and I haven't found the proof yet. But if you look in the phone book, there's a ton of them in there. But are they related? I don't know. 
and i've tried very hard because of my chest ski married one of my calcutta skis so yeah yeah norbert's grandmother was the machesky yeah so i've tried <laughs> on that too um there were small pockets of michigan wisconsin as we were mentioning maybe one or two families spent some time in west virginia even before they came here but the vast majority were from you know pittsburgh and chicago but i don't mean to leave out families that came from other areas because there definitely were some. Do you have any idea how the like, gloss thing was originally built? The gloss? G-L-O-S? G-L-O-S. I know there's a Kloss. K-L-O-S. I know there's Gaulus. G-O-L-U-S or G-A-L-U-S. But no, I don't know that one. But I... We have heard that it had a W in it. Uh-huh. As you get into the genealogy and the, the more depth you get into it, you'll find, and some of you may know this better than I did, I learned no Polish as a, as a teenager or a kid, anything. Female names have a different ending than male names. Single females have a different ending to their name than married females. And, and that could be part of where you get... Uh, okay, here's, here's an example. One I saw recently was Pinek. P-I-N-E-K is the father's name. The young daughter before she gets married is, I, th I think it was P-I-N-I-E, P-I-N-I-O-N-K-A. It's Pinek's daughter, but it's more like Pinofka. And, and the more you get into it, the more you'll have to learn what name to actually look for, because it could look very different than that father's, you know, surname. That Pinnock is very different. Klaus was Klauska or Klauskova. So y as you get into it, you'll find that there are other endings to your name. And you have to be aware of that so that when you actually see the name, you recognize it because you could go right past it and never realize it, which is, is hard. When Dad came to this country, he came to West Coast. What would be the base for the Polish community there? What was the name? Gloss. Gloss? Yeah. Uh, I would think the Milwaukee area still has an awful lot of Polish. If you were to write to the Milwaukee Polish or Genealogical Society, I forget the exact name, but there is a big Genealogical Society. They, they have a huge Polish fest similar to this too. Detroit, um, Detroit does, yeah, and did. In fact, Detroit has a tie-in to the publishing and it goes back to Jan Barzinski and actually the Vachoriks. Uh, the Vachorik married, uh, I don't know how to say it again, Gnaiet, Gnaiet. And the Gnaiet's father was a publisher in Detroit. So then you're tying the largest Polish newspaper in Chicago to the largest Polish newspaper in Detroit. And, and you can see how, you know, some of these royalty things you know, kind of connect. Uh, Wisconsin? Green Bay had some, like I mentioned. Um, I'm In the handout, I mentioned a few Polish genealogical societies. Those are wonderful resources, even if your family is not from that particular state, like the Michigan one is really nice. In fact, the lady who runs the uh, Michigan Polonia, uh, I happened to find her relatives that she was looking for in Poland. They were in the same church parish as my Kalkuskis were, and, and hers was a common last name. Um, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I said, well, gee, you know, there's an awful lot of those right here, and I told her where they were on the microfilm and everything, and she went and looked at it, and she said, by golly, that's them. 
so so that's a little connection I have with her but uh, she's very active in the in the Michigan Polonia which would include Detroit you know um, yes Manitowoc, M-A-N-I-T-O-W-A-I-E-C. You know, I might have that in my database that I have in my computer. If you remind me when we're done, I'll look it up and see which names I have there. Just because I don't have a gloss name in my database, if there's someone from the same town you know, you, you can still find that connection through a little bit more legwork. He was the only one of his family that came to this country. Yeah. There was one brother who came with him, but he went back. Uh huh. Dad was the only one that stayed here. Wow, that makes it harder. You've got a lot smaller. Uh, when you're when you have only one ancestor who stayed in the country, that really narrows down your surname. Um, you can look at it two ways. You can be glad it's not like a Smith, you know, or Klein, where, you know, everybody's got it. If it stands out a little bit, that's kind of nice. But if, if he didn't, if he wasn't out there, you know, in some way, in, in some marriage records, in obituaries, in newspapers, in something, then that makes it ten times harder to find him. Um, but the, the key is to ask questions, uh, you know, find out find out this this convent in Manitowoc and and see you, you just you just got to start by asking questions um, okay I wanna it's 2 30 and I know it's getting warm in here I don't want to make this go too long and and wear you out with the heat in here however I want to go through some steps for for beginning your your genealogy Okay, the handout that I have gives you some websites, some questions to ask in an oral interview. Some people find an oral interview very difficult to begin. Some people who are being interviewed find it very difficult to answer when you say, okay, tell me everything you knew about my grandfather. They don't know where to start. They need some focus. Um, the first page and about a quarter of the, the, your handout includes some questions. At the end of that list, I, I left or I, I included the website where I got those from, and that page is maybe a fifth of all the questions that that particular website had for asking oral interview questions. So if the, if you don't think this is quite your cup of tea or not what you're looking for try and check out that website. It might have more questions that are geared toward what you are, are looking for. <coughs> Excuse me. When you start your genealogy, the very first thing you need to do is to determine your purpose. If you say, okay, I'm going to find everything I can about the Kalkuskis, <laughs> like I did, I had no purpose when I started. And it wasn't such a bad thing, but it helps you if you're focused in on a narrow search because there's so much information out there, you'll just, you'll flounder, you'll get lost in it all. Um, what happened to me when I didn't define everything that I was looking for within just one of my lines, I started collecting the information about everybody then. And I mean everybody, whether they were related or not. I took the census, the marriage records, the obituaries, the newspaper, everything that I had access to, and I put them all in one giant file in my computer. And I find that helpful now, but it's taken a lot of hours away from what I originally wanted to research. Okay. Your purpose? <laughs> my purpose now is I put a Kalkuski book upstairs a few years ago and I want to complete it. That was, even in my eyes a few years ago, that was a rough draft. It was my first draft. And I put together 240 pages of family tree in maybe a year and a half. And, and to me, that was astounding. I couldn't believe I found that much when I, even my dad, 
knew no one outside of his some of his first cousins. He didn't even know all his first cousins. You know, because of circumstances, they were in Ogallala, there were others here and in Omaha, and they didn't have money to drive anywhere. You know, and and it it's sad. I I asked him, come on, and he said, no, really. There was no money for gas. We didn't drive to Omaha for the weekend just to go visit family. You know, not like we're lucky enough to get to do now. We lived in Oregon. My parents always said we would, they'd take us to Jenner's Park, which is a little city, uh -huh. like 30 miles. We didn't have the gas to do that. Yeah. It never did get to go there was a lot of circumstances why the mm -hmm. families have spread out and then lost contact, mm -hmm. you know, very much so. But if you can determine your purpose, suppose today I were to say, okay, I have found out about 75% of my Kalkuski family tree. I want to work on this part right here. Then for a few months I'll focus on just that and I'll do my best to make a lot of progress in one area at a time. But as you can imagine here with the Polish people, you know my grandma's aunt married somebody else's uncle who was related to my grandfather who was related to my grandmother and I really found that having this big database helped. So I have that available anytime if you want me to print out what I have. And like I said, it's not first-hand knowledge, but I've gotten it from the census, the marriage records, some obituaries, it's just anything I come across, I just toss it into that file and then I've got it for future reference. Um, when you determine your purpose, you need to organize your papers. Get a notebook, divide it, label it, have pockets in it for things that you don't want to bend or um, to, you know, to crease. If you go to Grand Island, you get a copy of their land deed, you don't want to bend it. You know, have a place to put everything. If you find that you fill up one notebook, <laughs> get another one right away. Get a drawer before you need it have your your own personal resources handy you know have a little area that's just for your genealogy so you know where things are have your own stapler your own file folders all your own little office supplies you need and you'll find that things will go smoothly then when you're actually trying to do the work you're not getting distracted by where did I put that okay I have a pile of <laughs> six months ago three months ago and a month ago of, of stuff that I need to go through and file but if I can vaguely remember when I got that information I kind of know which pile it's in I have bookcases and two four I have eight drawers full of uh, hanging files now and it's just I'm actually gonna go through it real soon and pare it down because I don't need all of it anymore but I did at first I kept everything I could about what newspaper was in which county, what years it was there. Um, if I saw a Badalik name, I knew it would relate to my Gavriks who related to, you know, so and so. And I kept a lot of that in just little manila folders. And I find now I've connected them all together. I don't need that anymore. But I did at first. So, so some extra file folders, um, uh, three ring binders and things like that I think is essential when you're getting started so that you can keep track of it all. The second thing after you know what you're going to look for is to collect your data and you're going to document everything you find you're going to write in the corner or on the back you're going to write where you found that okay if if I get this was a copy of, of a birth baptism from St. Anthony's in Farwell. I'm going to write on here, I, you know, Laura Anderson reviewed this document on this date at this place and this is where it's from, from St. Anthony's Church. And there's a lot of reasons for actually taking the time to do that. When somebody <laughs> else asks you, where'd you get that? You can say, I don't know, I just, I just got it a couple of years ago, I don't remember. It happens, it happens. But if you can say, I got that off the microfilm at the Nebraska State Historical Society of the baptisms at 
the Catholic Church in Farwell. Well then, you know, you help that other person either go find something for themselves and you authenticate your own work. You give it value. And it's, it's not just made up. It's not just what somebody said. You can say, no, this is the way it was recorded in the church records. And so you give it some value. And then the last thing you do once you've collected a whole lot of data is you want to present it in some way. You can keep it in your file drawers. You can put it on a computer program and print it out. You can make a nice little book and you can donate it to the Polish Heritage Center and they'll put it up in the genealogy collection upstairs. Um, which I think, again, it's fascinating. Several people from different families have done that. And if you go up there and look at some of those, you're going to find some Macheskis who married into some other line. And you'll get a little bit of tidbit out of those books for your families, too. <coughs> I, I can just, I guarantee it. Because they all married each other, you know. Um, Okay, which line are you going to work on? When you determine your purpose, you're going to pick your mom's line, your dad's, or your maternal grandmother, your paternal grandmother. Um, unless more than one of those lines is, is connected geographically, I really strongly urge you to pick just one, one part to work on at a time. But in this case, as we're working for the, through the Polish people who located right here, if they're all related through geography, then your geography becomes your, your uh, purpose. I want to look at Sherman County and I want to look at the marriage records and see what I can find about my family. It's not going to be one particular line, but you're going to go through and look at everything with your last name that you're looking for. And then at the end, go through it. You know, Make your copies, take it home, let it sink in, relax. Um, look it over more than once and and then you'll have a geographic kind of purpose which is what I ended up doing and why it, it got to be such a big big project um, use forms to write the data you already know the the interview forms or well, interview questions will let you write things out or record them um, these days a a videotape would be extremely useful if, if the person you're interviewing will let you do that. Then you can always refer back to it. It's very accurate and you don't have to write like crazy. Okay. Um, there are forms on the internet and in this particular book, this was one of the first books I bought. It was at uh, Barnes and Noble and I'm sure they're in any you know good sized bookstore and this simply has forms in it. Uh, a little bit of really generic information, but forms. You've got your, your pedigree charts, which you can fill out. There are things called a family group sheet, which look more like these. A lot of genealogists who trade information like these family group sheets. This gives you a place to uh, document name, dates, place, children, um, all kinds of, of good data. And it's a nice format. If you don't have access to a book like this, again, they're online. And if you go to, to any of the local libraries that has the, the web access, just uh, do a search. Uh, say family group sheet form and you'll probably find 50 places that you can go to to get them and just print them right out. Um, the other thing I had out was a research log and this is handy to keep for each one person or couple. You write down every place you've looked for information about this particular person or couple and when you looked at it. And this helps in the case where you're working on things for a long time. Say, I don't know if I ever went to that particular place and looked at that stuff. This can help you remember that you did. And maybe you need to go back anyway to that place. But this is a nice way of knowing where you've looked for that marriage certificate that you can't find anywhere. So you don't redouble your efforts. You don't go back and do things you've already done. 
Um, so use forms for as many things as you can. It just keeps things neat. If you have a software program, um, I use a Macintosh, so I use something called Reunion for Macintosh, and I've got it on my computer here that you can all feel free to look at. I've never used a PC in my life. I've always used Apple's, and so that for me was my only option. My mother and a lot of other people I know use Family Tree Maker. I don't know if it's because they don't they didn't read the manual. I know my mom didn't, but um, she has more problems figuring out where things go and how to retrieve it once she knows she's put something in there. So if you're going to get a software program, learn it. Read the manual and, and, and learn how to keep that data so that you can find it when you want it. Okay. Um, cite your sources. Again, when you're um, entering it into the computer, always add your sources whether if, if I get something from Lori through an email that's what my source is I don't have to make up some big grand scheme I just say received from Lori Wachorek on 12 September 2004 received by Laura Anderson you know and that way I, I give some credibility to that that information that I'm using and then if I have questions about it I can still go back to Lori and ask her if she has more more information. Uh, collect new data by going to relatives and other people. One thing I really want to do this trip while I'm here is I want to go over to Rose Lane and talk to a couple of people that are related to me by both <coughs> my grandmother's and my grandfather's side. So that's an interesting connection, but I don't know them. I've never met them. You know, I don't want to overwhelm them with a lot of things. But I do want to go over to Rose Lane, and that's an option for, for any of you, too. Find the older people in town and ask them if they use the form, the interview questions. Do they remember, you know, when so-and-so lived in town or when such-and-such such event happened? Um, that's one thing that I'd like to do. Uh, ask your relatives by phone, by mail, by email, in person whatever you can. You'll find that a lot of young people are not interested in genealogy. And it, it's the way it is. The old people pass away and then there's nobody left to ask. So if you can get into it, if you can get your kids or grandkids into it in the least bit, I, I hope you can, you know, while we're young. Uh, I even asked strangers, like I said, this lady I've never met, but I would really like to go meet this trip, is in Rose Lane. I took every Kalkuski name out of the white pages in the phone book in Nebraska. And granted, there weren't a lot, but there was probably 20 of them, and I wrote them all a letter. And I said, you don't know me, but... And then I followed that up with a phone call about a week later. So I gave them time to receive it, read it, throw it away, whatever. But then I followed up my letter to a stranger with a phone call, and it's amazing what, what came out of that. that was, it was just a good way to get started, because I had nowhere to start. <coughs> um, from online resources, you can collect an awful lot of new data. A lot of that is in your handout, and there's tons more besides just those, but those were just a few that I, I included today. Um, there are genealogical websites that are good for, for beginners. They have a lot of beginning tips. They'll say, here's how you start. Yes. RootsWeb, Ancestry, Genealogy.com, the LDS site. Some of you may be aware that the Mormons have the largest genealogical collection in the world, by far. Um, they send their young people out on missions across the world, and they microfilm church, civil, every kind of record that there is. Um, there is a really good family history center, which is part of the LDS church in Grand Island. I think I included the address and the phone number and the hours in your handout. If you've never been there, I, I really would like to urge you to just go 
and see what's there. I know several people have some good microfilms on permanent loan there, so you wouldn't even have to order something right away, but there would be something for you to look at to get used to the microfilm machine, to get, get used to what you have to do to get some good, good new sources. Um, Oh, good. Good. I didn't know that. Carney has one also. And um, I think I put in the handout the www.familyhistory.org that that is the LDS website. If you go to that main page, if you don't live in this area, you can click on that to find where the closest family history center is to where you live. They're, they're all over the, the place. The, um, the volunteers who work in there are very helpful. They're, they're gentle on you. They won't judge by what you know or you don't know when you're getting started. They're very nice and will help you. They do not try to recruit you. They, they will have, within the Family History Center, they'll have like this, a table in, on one side that has some, some literature about the LDS church, but they don't do anything in there to make you feel uncomfortable. So, and I know that's a big deal to, to some people. You don't want to go into some other church's place because it just simply makes you uncomfortable. This is one of those places that's real neutral ground. Okay, so if you have any inhibitions about that, don't worry. Don't worry at all. Well, if you can get online, there are a lot of search engines at Yahoo and Google and who's the guy, Ask Jeeves. Um, use a, a search engine within the web and just put your surname in there and see what comes up. Hopefully it's not Smith again, but, but with our good Polish names. Um, are you Smith? Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, with our good Polish names, you, you get a, a confined amount of, of returns on it. Uh, I have found three or four or five fairly active people in Poland who have my last name. So I'm, I'm tempted to sit down, write a letter one of these days and find out what part of Poland are they from? Could they be related? You know, I don't know yet. But your, your Google search or whatever search engine you use will also give you hits within the Roots Web and the Ancestry. And it'll give, lots of people put huge family trees online. And if you just search for a name in your family tree, you might find that someone else that you don't know has already put a lot of information on the web about that family, and you've got a little bit of instant connection there. Okay. Um, write or call the historical and genealogical societies in the area that you want to research. I know Sherman County has a historical society. It's not extremely active, I don't think. I don't hear a lot about it, but I know it's there, and I know they have a wonderful exhibit in there, too. Uh, Howard County has a very active historical society. They have a bit of genealogy, but what they have is the history of the towns, the schools, the post offices, the railroad, that kind of thing that impacted your family in this area. So sometimes those societies are very useful. There are also archives. Um, the Pittsburgh Archdiocese has an archives and they have a website. You can go to it, you can look for, uh, you can ask them to look for something and they'll send it to you. You don't get to look at the records and it, it's not as open you know, as, as I wish, but when was the last time I've been to Pittsburgh? Um, but if you send a request and a, and a small fee, I don't remember how much, they'll look up something and send it back to you. I asked them about uh, Father Anthony Claviter and what, you know, what was he like? What did he do there? I've heard stuff about him. Uh, they would not go into a lot of detail, but I did find that he was what they called a fallen priest from St. Stanislaus Koska in Pittsburgh. And something about finances overshadowed him. Well, guess what? When he was here, he sold the land that the church was, was to be built on. Or they were building it. I don't remember where in the timeline it falls. But he sold the land 
of the church to someone else outside of this area and the good people here had to go to that man and buy the land back. <laughs> so there's something going on with Father Claviter, but I don't know what. I wasn't there. Um, there was a lot of strife. The Baduras were very active in the church. And at the time, see, you start to learn history. There was the Polish something alliance, and then there was the Polish national some, ah, I'm sorry. I, I should have looked this up. The which one? Polish National Alliance. Polish National Alliance and another one. And if, if you read some historical books, some books about Poland and early Poles in, in the U.S., there was a faction who wanted everything Polish dominated by the church. And then there were those who didn't exactly want it through the church, they wanted it political. That's it. And there were those factions right here in Ashton. I read it in the newspaper. You know, some people were members of this group and some were members of that group. And they were very much at odds. So the early churches were were very much at odds too. Father Claviter walked into the Bohemian church at Warsaw and took it over in 1877. Well, how do you think they felt about that? You know, but I was, so there, there's a lot that you can learn on your own by, by looking in archives and, and things around here. All of the towns around here have a Jubilee church book, and usually most of them have a town centennial book. If you can find those, those are really helpful too. Um, Ashton, Farwell, Bolus. Um, I don't think I've seen one for Loop City, but, but they're around, and I'm sure in Platte County too because that's where an awful lot of Poles were before they came here too. Um, but those were not those recruited families so much. Um, your county resources, your, your newspapers, the courthouse. The courthouse is phenomenal here in Sherman County. Um, and I'm going to wrap up hopefully within five minutes so we can get out of here. Okay. Thank you for coming. Um, the courthouse will have land deeds, and you can research one piece of land through all the ages. You can see when your great-grandfather homesteaded this piece of land, you can see then who, who got it next and who got it after that. So you can kind of do your, your homestead's genealogy too, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but that also, again, it helps me find sons-in-laws and daughters-in-law who kind of disappeared from town. There's no obituary. I can't find anything about them after they got married, but they'll be mentioned in a land deed. You know, so things will turn up where you might least expect it. Um, the only land office when our ancestors were filing their homesteads were, was in Grand Island. So they, they went to Grand Island to fill out all the paperwork. If you don't have a copy of your homestead papers, they're really neat. I, I suggest that you you look for that and, and get it. Um, and once you once you have that homestead number from the la the land office in Grand Island, then you can write to the National Archives and get their copies of, of what they have too. Um, use your local libraries and don't forget about the Stir Museum and Grand Island. Even though it's not right here they have other genealogical data that will help you too. Um, Lincoln, again, the historical, so the historical society, um, and the Omaha Public Library, D W. Dale Clark. Um, they have an incredibly large selection of census on microfilm that you can use, and, and the people there in their historical and genealogical department are very nice and, and very helpful. So once you've collected a whole bunch more data, that's going to take a while, it's not going to happen overnight, then you want to organize it and present it in some way. Um, use your software, write it out longhand, type it, have somebody else type it for you, but in some way, please share what you find, whether it's just with your immediate family or whether it's with 
the, the Polish Heritage Center here or the local libraries or the Stewart Museum, please share because like us as beginners, we very much appreciate finding something that someone else has worked on and, and you might accept and use what they have put together, but it's only part of what you're going to work on. So it just if you can, share and, and help. You'll find that you're able to help somebody else around here. And, and if, if you needed help where I live, I'm part of a group called Random Acts of Genealogical Kindness. So if you need to look up in Wisconsin, if you can figure out what county they might have been in, you go to raogk.org and you look for somebody who's a volunteer in that county and they'll look it up for you for no cost except for copies and postage and and that's a good thing because when we're trying to research something far away you, you can't get there in person and you don't want to pay a lot for it so having these volunteers around is very helpful i do that for douglas county colorado if anybody has somebody there <laughs> um, and that's about all I have today. Are people pretty willing to share? Yeah. Are people willing to share? I'd say 95%. Uh, very much so. Especially if you approach them uh, in a nice, you know, friendly manner and say, I'm looking for information about so-and-so. And you're pretty specific about what you're looking for. Just ask them to find one specific thing and not some some goose chase for them but yeah yeah they are now one thing on the land record we found out that it's like if you don't know you know who your great grandmother was but you don't know who her parents were you have the old flat records and they'll be within five miles yeah usually within a couple of sections yeah they had word of all they had was horses and those guys were not ambitious yes and before 1880 almost all the marriages were still arranged yes Yes, that's a really good point. If you, I know Howard County has a really good plat map up on the wall, mm -hmm. big wall map. Have the yes, map. Mm -hmm. yes. It, it sometimes it's hard to find one for just the year you want, but you don't have to be real specific in the year because how often did our grandparents move? <laughs> right. Not like me. They stayed in one nice spot, usually for some time. Um, so yes, plat maps and in uh, in the county courthouses is a good resource. Anything else? Well, I really want to thank you for coming. I'm so glad to see you. Some familiar faces, some new faces, and some people that I've been corresponding with through email for several months and never met. So thank you. You know what? I don't. I should have brought some. But if you want to stick around for a few minutes and look at my computer and see what I might have for your family in the database, let's do that. And otherwise, you're free to go. I don't want to hold you up. It's getting warm.